thank you for taking the time. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we have a, a full agenda and uh, we want to highlight also that we do have an option for Spanish. Um, if you look at the bottom of the Zoom panel, there is a uh, on the I, there is an icon for interpretation, and you can choose if you would like to listen and prefer to uh, listen in Spanish. We will uh, we have Spanish translators here today. So um, we want you to keep in mind um, why we're here in your preferred language that was mentioned. This is a conversation as well as uh, we'll have some opening remarks, um, but please use the chat box, say hello. Uh, we won't have the time to make introductions. So please uh, feel free to put your name and your business, um, uh, your email, introduce yourself to our community here today um, and what industry you're in. Also, uh, if you didn't get the opportunity to submit your questions in advance, uh, go ahead and place your questions in the chat. We have quite a few in uh, that were submitted already and we'll try to get to through as many questions as we can um, with our guest speakers today. We also want to mention, as you probably already noted, we are recording this event today. We are also streaming live on Facebook um, and so uh, you can also return to review this material later if you so like or share it with your friends and family. So again, welcome. I'm excited to have such a large, uh, a distinct group um, of our colleagues from the various community chambers, culturally specific, culturally specific chambers. And um, I am going to now turn uh, uh, the mic is, uh, let's see, is Eddie Sherman in the house? And if not, I don't see him on the list. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to our Carmen Castro, Executive Director with the Hispanic Metropolitan Chamber. Thank you, Jan. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Buenas tardes a todos. Uh, aquellas personas que está, se han integrado al grupo, hay un icono abajo cuando ven la, el panel de Zoom que les da privilegio para escuchar todo en español. Es un, como un, un mapa. Si tocan ahí, pueden escuchar todo en español. Uh, again, we're happy to be here with you today. And I would like to make introductions since um, we have great speakers to, to help you today with all the information that we all wanna know. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Jessica Guernsey. Uh, Jessica received her master's in public health from Portland State University, worked at Multnomah County Health Department for nearly two decades, first came to the county as public health educator in 2001 to work on heroin overdose prevention and harm reduction. In 2007, she coordinated with culture-specific community-based organizations and state local partners on a strategic plan to respond to an influenza pandemic. She led the county's maternal child and family health programs and helped support the launch of the Future Generation Collaborative. Also, she is the Public Health Director at the Local Public Health Administrator from Multnomah County. So I'd like to give Jessica Guernsey a hearty welcome to our forum today. And uh, next, to our next speaker, I am so glad and honored to introduce Chair Deborah Kafuri. Uh, Chair Kafuri began her public service in the Oregon House of Representatives and served two years as the House Minority Leader. Since February 2020, she has led an unprecedented response to the COVID-19 pandemic. She also spearheaded the nation's largest per capita investment in homelessness in May 2020 ballot measure to fund homelessness uh, services and affordable housing. She co-founded the Joint Office for Homeless Services with the city of Portland and oversaw nearly 1 billion worth of new construction in Portland. 
She prioritized apprenticeship programs in contract of requirements that opened the door for more women, people of color, and veterans to pursue construction careers. She led a sweeping workforce equity effort to change the organization's recruiting, hiring, retention, and other practices to address systemic racism. She currently is the chair of the Multnomah County Commission. So welcome Chair Kafuri and Jessica Guernsey. And to that, I will go ahead and open the session. All right, well, I think, am I up next? Yes, you are. Thank you, thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm really um, honored to be here today. Uh, as, as you know, I'm Deborah Kafuri and I'm your Multnomah County Chair. Um, Jessica Guernsey, our Public Health Director and I are very, um, very excited to hear from you today. Um, we wanna give you a little bit of information this afternoon about our reopening. Um, but we also want to learn what you're experiencing so that we can engage in a real partnership as we move toward recovery. I think I can speak for just about everyone on this call when I say that COVID-19 has been the marathon that has truly tested every one of our enterprises. And while we still have a ways to go before it's over over, I think we can see the finish line in a way that we never have before. This is a moment to feel hopeful. 67% of county residents 16 and older have received at least one shot of the vaccine. And on Tuesday, the Oregon Health Authority announced their approval of the equity plan that we submitted last week and the state authorized Multnomah County to move to lower risk beginning today. So this is, this is great news. Um, and I wanna thank all of you for helping us get to this point. Lower risk means that we are much closer to full reopening. It means that more people can gather in restaurants, in gyms, in churches, synagogues, and mosques, and also at work sites. And as an employer, I've been asking a lot of the questions that I'm sure you're asking um, about how, what do we need to do to serve our clients and how do we do it safely? How and when should we bring employees back to work in the office if they haven't been already? And what about masks and vaccines? So I thought I would just first describe how, as an employer, Multnomah County is proceeding. We have about 6,000 employees who work in nearly 150 different buildings, from health clinics to the bridge shop to the libraries. And we are in dozens of neighborhoods. We know that, that those neighborhoods depend on, on us coming back, not just for our services, but because our employees spend money. They order lunch, they, they work out, they, they buy shoes. Um, so about half of our staff never went home. Folks like our epidemiologists, lab workers, the vaccination teams, doctors and dentists all went into the office to work. And we kept running the jails and the sheriff's office and parole and probation. Our emergency operations center was up and running 24 seven bridge and road maintenance, animal services, elections and the district attorney staff all have remained on site. So as we look to bring back the other half of our staff safely, I reached out to our department directors so we could prioritize what our clients need first. And what that means is that um, like the county attorney's office, which provides our internal legal advice, they're, they're probably gonna continue teleworking. But folks who uh, work at the front desks, who answer your, at the counters answering your questions about taxes or marriage licenses, or those who run senior programs, they'll go back into the office sooner. And we will continue to be vigilant about watching for symptoms of illness. And we're gonna to continue to ed educate and encourage everyone to get vaccinated. And we're all gonna be wearing masks. Um, I'm gonna ask Jessica Guernsey, who's with me on the call today, to talk about how we're dealing with the CDC and the state guidance on mask wearing. Well, she'll talk about that in a moment. But the COVID-19 crisis has shown us that there is so much that we cannot control. But it has also shown us how resist, resilient and strong that we can be when we pull together for a common purpose, like protecting each other and protecting the members of the community that are the most vulnerable and some of whom might be part of our respective workforces. I wanna thank all of you um, for using every ounce of pluck and grit to navigate this changing public health guidelines and a very uncertain business climate. 
And I know that I can count on you as leaders in our community to take on that challenge with me. And um, before I turn it over to Jessica Guernsey, who's gonna give you a more detailed public health update, I also just wanted to mention that, you know, we may not have every the answer to every one of your questions today, but feel free to ask anyway. And if we don't have the answer, we'll write it down and we'll get back to you. Um, we know that there are, things have been changing very rapidly and there's obviously gonna be even more change on the horizon. So um, just be, be, be patient with us as we um, as we will try to answer all of your questions and hopefully hear from you as well about what you're going through and what your thoughts are. So with that, uh, Jessica. Thanks everybody, can you hear me okay? Great, good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be with you again. My name is Jessica Guernsey. Um, I'm your public health director. I use she, her, hers pronouns. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we're seeing in the community in terms of disease spread. And like Chair Kapori said, um, talk a little bit about the public health advisory we put out regarding mask usage. Um, before I get started, I too really just wanna thank you all. I am really just so proud of our county and particularly our business community in how strong the partnership has been um, in terms of, of you all really holding up um, physical distancing um, prevention strategies that I know have been very difficult on you all. So I am just so indebted for your partnership and just really, um, again, proud to be part of a community where I feel like people really um, just pitched in and um, made hard decisions to protect the health of the community. I live out in the Lentz neighborhood. Um, we frequent many of the businesses restaurants, food carts, um, and have throughout the duration of the pandemic. And we're just really excited that today we're going to get back into more um, going out. I'm a little bit scared about how much money I'm going to start spending. I have to be honest with you. So I, mean, I may never make dinner again. I don't know. Um, but just to talk a little bit about um, COVID-19 and what we're seeing, um, I just want to touch on the fact that um, as um, Chair Kafori said, we are not out of the woods yet. Um, the vaccine metric that the state moved to um, about a week and a half ago, um, the 65% metric of folks with one dose of uh, the vaccine, at least one dose of the vaccine, um, does not get us to herd immunity. Um, and it's not indicative of what we're seeing in terms of disease spread. So while we are on the right track in terms of disease spread, going down, as you know, just a few weeks ago, we had a fairly um, large wave, a spring wave of, of COVID. Um, and uh, it is, like I said, coming down, which is good news, but we're still seeing spread in the community. So while the CDC um, recently recommended that um, uh, folks that had full vaccination, um, they could do certain things with no masks, um, we did issue a public health advisory as we moved into low risk because of what we know on the ground locally. Um, I often say all public health is local, um, so that we are not in opposition to what the CDC says. And we, as you can imagine, are often in contact with the CDC and they are not opposed to a local recommendation that is different than what they're currently recommending because what they're recommending is broad and what we know is what's happening on the ground. Um, so they're speaking from a national perspective, not a local level. Um, so just knowing what our numbers are, we look carefully at our own disease spread, who's getting sick, what our hospitalizations look like, and, and that's how we make our decisions. Um, so the local data definitely is telling us that we're seeing a difference with the vaccines. They're very effective. Um, we want to see people continue to get vaccinated. Um, we know not everybody has had an equal opportunity to access the vaccines. That's why we built out our equity plan on our current activities. Um, and they're definitely making a huge difference and they're very effective. Um, but we know that a third of our population that are eligible still need an opportunity to get vaccinated. So what that means is, is that disease can still spread. Um, so again, we issued a public health advisory urging folks, whether or not they're vaccinated, to wear a mask in indoor public spaces. Um, we have signs and posters that we've um, created in multiple languages um, that businesses um, and other folks can use to help um, educate folks about this. And I know, like I, I, as many people have already mentioned, I know it has been a long 14 months, believe me, I know. And um, there has been a lot of suffering um, in the health front, economic front, 
Um, and the masks have been very effective, very, very, very effective in helping us through this. Um, we are going to continue to advise to use them for now, but we're not going to we're not going to have them forever. Um, but it is a tool that we can use in the community while we're continuing to get people vaccinated. Um, so we're really just urging people um, to uh, obviously get vaccinated. Um, if, if folks um, know a neighbor or a family member that maybe needs help with transportation or childcare that might facilitate them getting a vaccine, um, reach out to them and see what you can do to help. Um, and again, we're just urging everyone to continue using masks for the immediate future in all indoor public health, excuse me, public settings, um, whether they've been vaccinated or not. Um, so one of the other things that I just wanted to mention, and we can talk a little bit more about this, is that we have heard from many businesses and many business um, organizations that the um, state uh, guidance for businesses to um, determine who is vaccinated and who is not um, at a business setting is pretty untenable for, for businesses. Um, and that's one of the factors that um, helped us make a decision in terms of the continued use of masks. Um, Cause there really is no practical way to distinguish um, the vaccinated from the unvaccinated. Um, and I know it's a uh, high impact um, for businesses. So for now uh, we are gonna continue this public health advisory um, till we're at, at a place that we're at least 70% of folks statewide are fully vaccinated. Um, we feel like that's the best approach to take to protect the public's health. Um, the public health advisory is voluntary, but if you hear me or see me, you will, you'll notice I say this repeatedly um, because my job is really to look at the health of the entire community and, and we know that this works. So I'm gonna be here for the whole hour and I'm happy to answer any questions that folks have. Thank you so much, Jessica. And thank you, Chair Kafori, for those opening remarks. We're going to open up now to our questions. So if you have questions for Chair Kafori or for Jessica, please put it in the chat. Um, we do have a few questions that were submitted um, that I will um, start to go through right now. So um, I think this would be for Jessica. Um, you, it, how soon do we expect the population of Multnomah County to be fully vaccinated? Um, that's a great question. And I always often joke about my um, COVID-19 crystal ball that I look into to try and guess what's going to happen. Um, you know, I don't know that we'll ever, ever be fully vaccinated as a community. Um, you know, we know that um, there are lots of different beliefs around um, different vaccinations, and um, I don't, I don't know that we'll ever get to full vaccination. Um, we do know that you know our numbers have been coming up, especially where we have disparities in vaccine uptake. Um, we're at about 68 percent, um, at least one dose right now. Um, our numbers have slowed a little bit in terms of overall vaccination. I was really pleased today, I have to say, to see how quickly. Um, vaccine uptake is happening with adolescents. So it hasn't been that long that younger younger folks have been eligible for um, vaccine and we're seeing a fairly quick uptake across the community in those age groups. Um, you know, that being said, the governor did lay out a metric of 70% of um, at least a first vaccine across the state for us to move out of a risk framework, which um, we, I, I was with a group of people before this call and, and we were guessing between end of June, mid July, we may hit that 70% for the state. Um, again, that is not a metric that's tied to disease spread. So that does not mean that we're not seeing transmission. Thank you. Thank you for that. We have quite a few business owners in our audience today. Um, there's a few questions here related to um, operations. So here's one from a business owner who says, I do not feel comfortable serving customers that aren't vaccinated. What do we do about people that choose not to get vaccinated? And how can we tell who's vaccinated or not? Is there a plan in place for vaccination identification? There's some so questions can there. I can take part of that from a public health perspective. Um, that's part of the reason we um, decided on the public health advisory for um, continuing to mask. 
um, because there really isn't a reliable way to uh, assess whether someone's um, vaccination card, for example, is not forged. Um, it's fairly easy to use. I think many of folks have probably seen them, they're paper cards. Um, so um, there really isn't like a great way to track that. Plus, at least from the folks that I've talked to in the business community, it's very, very cumbersome. Um, it would be very difficult to um, implement a system um, and feel like it was reliable. Um, so the next best thing is really um, continuing to mask for now until more people get vaccinated and we're seeing less disease transmission, which we are watching our numbers really carefully. So I have not seen a plan. The state is releasing um, some technical guidance this week regarding vaccination verification. Um, that being said, I think, you know, for um, some businesses and business owners that may be on the phone that um, have um, employees that serve alcohol, you know that there's intensive training for any sort of ID verification. So I, I think it's a hard position to be in. And I've definitely heard from a lot of folks that feel like they can't do that. And so um, really, again, the next best thing is to make sure people are masked. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, I believe earlier you mentioned that uh, um, with that masking recommendation or uh, for public health, there are some posters or signs that have been created. Um, how can business owners get access to that? And um, is that some a link or uh, can they have those printed so that they can post it in the front of their uh, storefronts? Yeah, I can. Um, I'm not really good at multitasking on Zoom. So when I'm not talking, I will post the link. Um, we do have it up on our website. And then I believe our public information office is working on getting some printed and I can follow up with folks to um, access the, the printed ones. That's great. And I, I do believe I heard uh, that those are also being translated so they can be also obtained in other languages if I'm not mistaken. Okay, great. Um, let's see, there's, uh, sorry, I'm trying to monitor the chat as well. So if my co-hosts see a, a question in the chat, if you could let me know. Um, otherwise, I will continue uh, with the questions here that were submitted earlier. Um, so uh, a couple of questions related to, again, small businesses. Um, will there, let's see, sorry, just a sec. Uh, will there be PPE resources, particularly plexiglass, that would be made available to small businesses? That's a great question. And we um, actually um, are in the process right now of trying to uh, figure out what the need, what business the needs are for smaller businesses, especially who don't have as much access to and haven't had access to some of the um, PPE loans or the, any of the, the, the big dollars that have come into our state. I know that the city of Portland right now as well, and some of the, the other cities in Multnomah County received um, a lot of dollars from the federal government and they through the uh, American Rescue Funds Act and they're trying figuring out how to distribute that money right now. So that's something that we will um, will keep on our on our on our list of um, issues that people would like to have and if you have other things like that that would be helpful, please let us know. At this point I don't have a specific area to, to direct you to, but it is something that I know that people are, are interested in. And I agree. I just want to say real quick in uh, John Vashatinsky, who's uh, from my staff, who's on the call as well. Um, he's been, he's our sustainability director and also our, uh, become our business liaison. Um, he wrote in the chat the link to uh, download the posters that you were talking about earlier. Um, and then also I, on the call, I have uh, Nicole Buchanan, who is another one of my staff who does health and human services. So if you have any questions later, um, they've put their contact information in the chat as well. Great, thank you, Chair Kafori. Um, which is probably connected to this other question. Uh, will there be more financial grants in Multnomah County to help small businesses impacted by COVID-19? And um, I don't know if you wanna say more about that, but it sounds like those are coming hopefully, uh, but not known completely yet. 
Yes. And I think if, if, if folks specifically want to reach out to uh, John and Nicole, who put their information in the chat, so we can kind of compile who we're, we're, it's hard to know who has already received loans and grants and who hasn't, which sector. So we're trying to decipher that at this moment. Um, we're also working very closely with uh, Prosper Portland and, this, and the city of Portland to help you know distribute equitably throughout our county. Um, so if you reach out to us and let us know, you know, the name of your business and what sector, that will help us compile the information. Great, thank you, Chair. Um, all right, so some other questions here in, in the, um, oh, I see one in the chat. Maybe I won't go there. Um, all right, we have a question in the chat. What about in the office or public space capacity numbers? Um, is 50% or less capacity of people mass still the recommendation recommendation or are we moving towards being able to be to bring or are we moving toward being able to bring full staff back? So if you um, in the chat also uh, John Vashatinsky has put the public se the se sector guidance so um, it tells you that when you when we are in low risk, which we are today, it will tell you, depending on what sector you are, sorry, sector sector guidance, which sector you're in, whether you're a, a gym owner or you have an office building, it tells you um, where you are in terms of, uh, of capacity. And then um, I know that the state is still preparing more information about that because it it's not as clear for office buildings as it is for say gyms, restaurants and retail establishments. Jessica, did you um, have something to add to that? No, I was just way earlier in the chat. I had put a link that had some of the specific numbers in there. It was at the beginning of the meeting though. Thank you, Jessica. And I think John reposted the sector guidance. So depending on what sector your business is in, that's where you'll be able to determine what percentage of occupancy you can have. Um, so that's the reference for your guidance. I believe it's sort of like a table, like a matrix. And so um, that information um, is, is, is really helpful to have. And that's what you wanna keep track of. Um, great, uh, thank you. Um, we have another question here. Um, regarding employees, um, can I make it a requirement for employees to be vaccinated? Um, and is that and uh, not be exposed to any legal action or complaint? Um, well, complaints, I can't guarantee. Um, uh, so not no on that one. Um, there have been businesses that, and schools that have been requiring, I'm sure you all have seen many universities who are also businesses, um, have been requiring um, COVID-19 vaccination for students and staff and faculty re to return. I, I would suggest um, talking if you have HR, an HR department or someone you can talk to that's an HR professional just to understand the nuances um, uh, regarding um, uh, requiring vaccinations. Um, it You can do it. Um, I just advise that people think about having a conversation. But like I said, as far as complaints, I, I can't, can't help with that one. Okay. All right. Um, I, I have another question here in the chat or in the um, submitted earlier. Um, are there any consequences for people who don't get the vaccine? Um, yeah, and are there going to be stricter restrictions? Stricter <laughs> restrictions. That's hard to say uh, for those who don't get vaccinated. Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, I, I, that generally doesn't work. Um, uh, there's been um, no discussion around there being um, stricter restrictions. Um, that, that I've been a part of. Um, and right now the COVID-19 vaccine is voluntary with the exception of workplaces that I said previously have actually mandated it for employees. We are um, working and I talked a little bit in my opening about the um, equity plan that we submitted to the state. We are working really closely with um, a lot of our culturally specific organizations um, and partnering with a, with a 
a lot of folks in the community because we know that there are folks still out there who will, would and will get the vaccine, uh, but they need to hear it from trusted community partners. They need to hear it from, from people in their own community who've, who've gotten the vaccine and haven't had you know, horrific side effects. They need to know that there's transportation to get them to and from the vaccine site. They need hours that are accessible. So as we, um, you know, the, the big VAC sites that they had were, were successful at getting a lot of people through quickly, but that left out a lot of members of our, of our community. So we're working in partnership um, with, with many uh, organizations that I'm sure that you all belong to as well to ensure that, uh, that people who want to get vaccinated have the, the information that they need so they can feel comfortable um, to get it. We, we still believe it is the right thing to do and, um, and want to make sure that as people who want to get the vaccine have access to get it. Thank you. Um, we have a couple questions is um, uh, more towards uh, the county. Um, we have an individual that is uh, not asking a question, not completely vaccine related, but uh, related to the county. Um, uh, this individual said, uh, I've designed hundreds of low cost housing in Cebu in the Philippines uh, using secondhand 20 foot shipping containers. The containers was a complete apartment unit with bathroom, kitchen, and small living room, bedroom. Um, this has, a, uh, who, who at the county would be willing to look at this kind of housing? And if so, could, could, who could this person talk to? So um, the person on my staff who works on housing and homelessness issues is uh, Liam Frost. And uh, John, if you could put Liam's uh, contact information into the chat, that would be great. Um, feel, free, feel free to reach out to him with your ideas and, and your suggestions. Great, thank you, Chair Kafori. Uh, we also have one from another business owner. I'm not sure if this is connected to the county or might be the city, but I'll ask the question. Um, uh, this business owner has received support from Paco to help keep business afloat during the pandemic. Uh, what, if any, can the county and the city do to help more veteran women and minority owned contractors prioritize permitting it appears large projects due to income is prioritized over smaller projects and that causes hindrance and real pain for smaller businesses. Uh, that's a very interesting point. I, the county doesn't do a lot of permitting. We do just permitting in, in the unincorporated areas of our county. But I do know that um, I just saw Lee Fleming who is um, with Multnomah County, and he just posted some information in the chat as well. Um, Lee, would you put your contact information in the chat if people have other questions about um, contracting and permitting so they can reach out to you? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. It looks like it was flagged for me that I missed a question regarding hearing loss. So I'm gonna try to scroll through here and, and find it. Um, my apologies. There's quite a bit of chat chatter going on. Um, okay, maybe this is the question. Uh, it's the um, author wrote, Deborah, you and Governor Brown seem to be trying to be politically correct. Regarding communities you feel haven't had any opportunity to get vaccinated, why aren't you being more politically correct regarding hearing loss disabilities? I can have Jessica talk a little bit to how we make uh, and how we give the guidance that we do. And we do take into consideration that um, people with disabilities, especially people who have hearing loss, and um, it, it's difficult for to hear people when you when you have a mask covering your face. But we also know that masks save lives. And um, it's it, this is not going to be something that we're going to be dealing with for the rest of our lives. But for the next short amount of time, people have been so good to the to date. And that's why we have such low numbers compared to the rest of the country here in Oregon and in Multnomah County. I know it's uncomfortable. Um, uh, my, you know, it, it causes, it causes, you know, uncomfortable. It's hard for people to hear. It's hard sometimes for people to breathe. But when you weigh the good that it does in saving people's lives, um, that's why we recommend uh, continued mask wearing just for a short time more. Jessica, did you want to add something about how we make these decisions? 
Yeah, no, like I said before, um, the decision around specifically the um, uh, public health advisory regarding the continued mask use is um, completely based on our local data, and especially where we're seeing disparities in um, uh, COVID-19 spread, hospitalizations, and unfortunately deaths. So um, there, there aren't a lot of good choices to make here. They're all really challenging, and I don't want to minimize the impact on any population. Um, there's been a lot of um, consequences, frankly, to these decisions that we've had to make. Um, so, you know, it's not, it's, it's kind of the, the worse, the, the less bad decision to make in the current situation. But as Chair Kofori said, particularly around the continued mask use um, and um, trying to buy some time as we get our vaccination numbers up, um, we have such good evidence that both of those things work in tandem. Um, we have actually done really well in this pandemic, all things considered as compared to other like-sized jurisdictions, um, and we'd like to, to minimize especially the devastating loss. I mean, one of the things that I wanted to say, we often talk about numbers, but each, each of those numbers is a person. Um, it's, you know, each death is a child, a sister, a brother, a mother, a father, a cousin, a partner that we can't replace. They're, they're gone. And, you know, for me, right now our focus in these difficult choices is to mitigate that um, right now and again I don't want to minimize the impact it has on other consequences but that's really how we're making the decisions Hi, thank you Jane, can I can I jump in for just to follow up hi good James afternoon. Parker hey good afternoon everyone uh, James Parker uh, enrolled citizen for the Chippewa Creek Tribal Nation executive director for the Oregon Native American Chamber um, and, and Doctor, uh, you really brought up a, a fantastic point about how this connects personally with uh, communities, especially when looking at the um, zooming in at that level. Um, I, you know, I, what, uh, from our point of view, you know, uh, we look at our statistics, and one in every 475 Native Americans has died since the pandemic began. Uh, COVID is killing Native Americans at a faster rate than any other community in the, in the United States. Um, and like you said, we see our family, our aunts and uncles, our grandmothers and parents, and those that have suffered from this illness um, um, and, and loss. Um, and so when when I, I heard Chair Kafour, you, you, you mentioned how um, you, you were connecting with um, uh, community-based organizations, culturally specific organizations. Um, how can you talk a little bit about how uh, you're messaging that to, to really kind of get at the local level and and to bring forward the, the, the stories that are really impactful and and bring home how this is um, uh, just how critical it is? I, you know, so much of this has been made uh, political, um, but at, at times we need to really just kind of focus on the real life stories um, and the impacts. and. How are we using our communications and our marketing strategies to really uh, tell that story of, of those impacts? Thank you. Thank you, uh, James. It's good to see you. Um, and I'll have Jessica go into a little more detail because it's her team that's really been, been doing the outreach. But um, we have since the beginning of the pandemic, um, once it was, especially it was clear from very early on that there were disproportionate impacts from the virus on who, who was being um, infected and then who was ultimately dying from the disease. It's not a surprise because we know that generations of systemic racism, um, government inattention, lack of healthcare have created these, these disparities. And so we um, wanted from the very beginning to be intentional about how we were developing our plans. So starting back with, with testing and contact tracing and now with, with vaccinations, we've we've co-created our plan with community so that um, it's not just Multnomah County trying to tell people what to do. We know that doesn't work. Uh, a lot of communities have a history um, of not a distrust, rightfully so, with government. So going working with community members who who can walk alongside um, their partners in you know walking alongside them in their in their steps and also telling their stories as as you mentioned, James, we've participated in. Uh, hundreds of, of calls like this um, with, with community leaders talking about their own experiences, whether it was with someone in their family dying from COVID or whether it was their experiences about getting the vaccine and how it made them, you know, how they felt afterwards, whether they had symptoms or not. And answering any question, none is 
you know, all the questions are, are good questions about, some people have concerns, what's, what's in the vaccine? What's it gonna do to you? And having uh, community leaders talking those through with their community members is much more helpful than having, um, you know, having me telling people why it's, why it's the right thing to do. Jessica, do you wanna talk a little bit more about how your um, team created these plans? Sure, yeah, and I really appreciate the question, James. Um, and this is really the foundation of our response. Our teams under um, Peru, um, Peru Wang and um, uh, Tamika Brazil, Charlene McGee, um, Maria Lisa Johnson, I could name dozens of people on our staff that have been um, working literally 24 seven um, to ensure that their communities are safe and that they're getting the information in the way they wanna hear it and from whom they need to hear it to make an informed decision. So. In public health a couple of years ago, we really started to build out much more um, strongly our culturally specific community partnership unit. Some folks might be familiar with Future Generations Collaborative, our Pacific Islander Coalition, um, our work um, with uh, natural helpers in the Latinx community, REACH, um, Achieve, Healthy Birth Initiative. All of these are culturally specific strategies and regardless of their original focus, um, they have been instrumental in us building out a culturally specific strategy that reaches people where they're at. Um, and that really includes um, all parts of the community, whether it's business, um, faith, spiritual, um, you know, just community members, community health workers. Um, so that really has been a strategy that we built upon. Um, and just a little bit warning, I don't know if you all are experiencing this, we're having high winds in Southeast and my electricity is going in and out. So if I disappear, because our lights have been flickering, I, I will try and figure out a way to rejoin. Um, sorry. Uh, so that really has been the foundation for our response. And actually, if you look at our equity plan, um, and maybe John or Nicole, if you can drop that link into the chat, um, there's a couple examples that we cite of specific work that has been done. Um, I know that I've attended, as Chair Kofori said, probably hundreds of evening and weekend sessions with community um, to help support any questions people have um, regarding the vaccine, testing, um, long hauler syndrome, a variety of things. Um, but, you know, as they say, that really is the bread and butter of our response um, because understandably so, people here need to hear from their own community and identify with their community's experience to make decisions. So that's really what we're gonna be doing more of in the next several months to close the um, vaccine gaps. Thank you both. And so Thanks. if I can just, um, can I just say something, give feedback to what was just said? This is Shannon with Women's First. Is it okay if I can just say something real quick? Hi, Shannon. I just wanted to say, um, I just appreciate the comment that was just said because most definitely we are um, working on that whole um, approach of really trying to enforce the um, vaccinations to our communities. We, we are currently working with Charlene McGee and the whole reach uh, Multnomah County groups over there um, to um, get this education um, get our women at our organization. We've already connected um, the Multnomah County team, um, Charlene and Tamika Brazil, um, those folks over at um, uh, um, at the uh, county over to connect them with our church, Emmanuel Church. They've been doing many of uh, vaccination events at our church. Like as we didn't have probably about four or five at our church um, so far. And so we're really trying to um, do this education piece because as speak, I mean, education, um, because we understand the historical um, disconnect from our communities of folks, you know, looking over the years of vaccinations and how it's been, you know, people feel like we're, we've been treated as guinea pigs to try to get vaccinations and uh, the fear of, you know, um, not knowing of how this is going to play out. And then all the stuff that's happened recent with COVID testing and then folks who died of it and, you know, the, the, um, the blood um, veins and all this, all the stuff that's happened. So people are like, well, I'm not gonna do it. I'm just gonna go ahead and continue to, you know, wear my mask. And so most definitely as the founder and president of um, Women's First, we, we can't force anyone to do anything that they don't want to do. However, we are connected with, we just got a whole 
um, big um, large supply from the county. They just distribute some more masks, some more hand sanitizers, and you know, just so that we can be able to give out those masks and hand sanitizer bottles to let them know as long as if you're not ready to get the vaccination, then we want to make sure that we are continuing to keep them with the masks and hand sanitizers. But one of the things that we're, you know, still sending out the emails to the families and um, women in our communities, in our organizations about vaccinations events that's going on either at the church or nearby their agencies or, or where the women live at within the organizations so that they are um, educated on where those are um, located in their areas. Um, also too, one of the things that came up is we was a part of the trainings. There was a couple trainings that we had the women to be part of in those information sessions to let them know as uh, Chair Kafori was saying, a lot of times if you just have some information that this goes out, but having someone that looked like us to be able to share the information of the educational information, but then also who's ever been vaccinated that looked like us as well, that can say, hey, I got the shot and maybe it might've made me drowsy for the first couple of days but now I feel good because I know that I'll be safe. Um, so we're looking on to, um, you know, uh, people have said, well, we'll make an extension for by the fall, um, how everything plays out to be. If everybody's okay, nobody has, you know, died or there's no significant things, then we're looking at maybe by then we can have some of the women to say, okay, yay, I'm going to go ahead and get vaccinated. But until then, I'm going to continue to wear, you know, my mask and keep my sanitizer and keep my social distancing. So I just want to just to address that because we are working within our organization to really, you know, um, put that, you know, get that information out and educate our women as well um, and their families um, that this is something that, you know, is very important as well and working with the county team. Thank you very much, Shannon. We appreciate what you're doing in the community. And um, I, uh, I know that um, I benefited from the, the uh, vaccine shots and the clinic held at the Emanuel Hospital, or excuse me, Emanuel Church myself. So um, that's great. And that's why we're here today as a community, as a community gathering to encourage each other um, to be safe and how to be safe and, and to learn from the county why this is so important uh, for public health. Um, and I know there's many community leaders in the room, in the Zoom room with us as well that have uh, 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 just as much passion and drive that you have for Women First and that's, that's pretty amazing. And we should talk later about some collaborations uh, furthering for our black and brown communities. Most definitely um, would love to have that conversation with you as well. Um, I wanna return back, we're nearing the end of our time and I just wanted to um, give an opportunity. Uh, we covered most of the questions and good comments and good dialogue, but I wanna give opportunity for Chair Kafori and for Jessica to have any um, closing remarks you wanna make before we um, uh, wind up our day together. I'll just end with the thank you. Thank you for to all the hosts for uh, putting this uh, conversation today together today. It's um, as as since the beginning of COVID, having communication is just crucial because things are changing so quickly, and there's so much information. It it can be difficult at times to really wrap your head around all of it. And so, if um, my team has put their contact information into the chat, please feel free to reach out to us if you didn't get your question answered, or if you have a question tomorrow that you come that you think of, just send us a note. We're here, we're here to help you in any way you can. And if there are um, suggestions that you have about how ways that government can make things easier for you, either as a community member or for your business, please let us know that as well. Um, we do have uh, frequent conversations with folks at the state at OHA and in the governor's office, and we can pass along. We have been since the beginning sharing with them where we think that they're not doing as good of a job or ways that they can help um, make, make their information more uh, understandable to folks. So thank you. Thank you again for um, all your time this afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Chair Kapori. Um, and I, for our uh, closing remarks, if you don't have any further remarks, Jessica, I'll turn it over to thank you. I'll turn it over to Jesse Hyatt. Uh, Jesse is executive director 
uh, and uh, for the Black American Chamber of Commerce. And he is one of our partners in the Community Chamber Coalition. Um, as you heard from uh, Carmen and myself and James. James, did you wanna say something since uh, we didn't get you the chance to speak before we turn over to Jesse for the closing? Uh, no, I know we're running out of time. It's just been um, uh, a real honor to have uh, Chair Kafori and our public health official um, to spend time with us today. Um, we know how important this is in our communities. Uh, we understand how important these, um, you know, COVID has been both as a public health crisis um, as well as a financial crisis in our communities. Um, really looking forward to, to finding ways to to partner and um, and ensure that um, our our communities and also our businesses have the best information uh, to keep everyone safe, keep themselves and their families safe. So thank you. Thank you, James. And now I'll turn it over to Jesse Hyatt. Jesse, take it away. Thank you, Jan. All right. Well, we've come to the end. Uh, before you go, we wanted to take a moment to give thanks. Um, thank you to all of the Chamber community members in attendance today um, and who will be watching later uh, for taking the time to be engaged. There were a lot of good questions asked and a lot of uh, good information shared, and we hope it has a beneficial impact for you. Thank you to our interpreters, Carolina and Alicia as well. Next, thank you to all of the culturally specific chambers that make up the Community Chamber Coalition for making time to co-host and the behind the scenes prep work. Uh, Jan Mason, president of the Philippine uh, American Chamber and her staff, who did a lot of the heavy lifting for this event. Um, uh, Eddie Sherman, president of the Oregon Native American Chamber, um, as well as James Parker, the executive director for the Oregon Native Chamber and their staff. Carmen Castro with the Hispanic Metropolitan Chamber and her staff and the staff at the Black American Chamber. Before we give our final round of thanks, I wanted to take a moment to speak to the importance of the time in which we are living. It has been an unprecedented last 14 months. We have seen firsthand how systemic inequities have compounded the pandemic for the BIPOC communities. We have also seen a shift though in focus towards equity and inclusion. But while words are good, actions are truly needed to see change realized. Today we saw an action. Our county chair, Deborah Kafori and director, Jessica Guernsey, have given several talks to the community, but today they chose to talk with the Community Chamber Coalition and its members. And it's direct actions like this, coupled with their equity-focused approach for reopening, that'll lead to positive lasting impacts on the communities that we serve. With that, a big thank you to Chair Kafori and Director Guernsey. We look forward to future partnerships for the betterment of all those we serve in Multnomah County. Thank you, everyone, and stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day.